Okay, so this lecture is on identity and self-concept, uh, who you are, how we formulate a sense of self and how it gets defined, how it gets constructed in our minds and what it is. Um, this is a survival mechanism, self-concept. Anybody know specifically why this one would be important? Which hierarchy of need would this be specifically important for? Anybody want to make a guess? Love and belonging. Yes. It is 100% love and belonging. Because how you create a concept of self has everything to do with fitting in to your community, right? Belonging, how do you know you belong? How, know, how do you know you're worth belonging? How do you know what your value to your community is, what you bring to the survival of your unit, right? You have to have some sense of, of what inherently you, you can share, what you can provide. So that third hierarchy of need belonging is a big freaking deal. It's huge, right? Again, because the stronger your community, the stronger your access to food, water, and shelter, healthcare, right? So they all, it's, it's the one thing that you, we, when you look at different adaptations of Maslow's pyramid, you'll see that some pyramids that have become three-dimensional where they're adding, these can shift. They don't have to be always in that order, right? When people are held hostage or you're in a cult mentality, your cult becomes more important than food. Because your cult and you doing what they say is how you get access to inclusion food. So can you see how they can flip-flop, right? So identity is a big deal. Identity is a huge part of shame, which is the foundation of all mental illness, all of them. Shame, the belief that you are unworthy, that you are permanently rejectable, disapprovable, that you have nothing to give, that what you give is crap, right? So that belief can become an identity and how you relate to people. And it can become how you connect and bond, trauma bonding, right? So you can think you're a horrible human and you know what, it feels good sometimes if you can find someone else who thinks they're a horrible human. And then you can commiserate and that can feel like community. It can be important, but it can also be extremely toxic. It can promote um, uh, other mental health problems like substance abuse because that's how you start to feel better or worthy of inclusion. So identity is a big deal. Who am I? This is something in philosophy that people are, you know, what does it mean? How does this happen? What part of it? Which part of, you know, I am who, you know, all of these things. So we're not going to go that deep. I'm going to keep it pretty specific to survival mechanisms. I'm going to turn this. Can you guys see that okay? I don't want all the lights off. No, I'll go here. Which one do we normally have on? This one? No, this one? <laughs> okay, good enough. I'm gonna try to follow these slides just so you know, because usually I get ahead of them and then I'm... So yeah, how we create a concept of self. Our thoughts, you know, a lot of people connect their thoughts to themselves. Uh, every single one of you connects your body to your identity, which is a huge problem. It's actually extremely problematic. However, it's the visible sign of your who you are, your face. That's how people know who you are, right? So it's very easy for people to get an attachment to the conditions of their body and then lose touch with whatever this is, right? And some people think this is religious, and it's not. And religions can't patent your soul and tell you what you can and cannot do with it. They like to think they can, but they can't. So, moving into this. Where do you begin? And this is important. I want you guys to really think about yourself when I go through this. Where does you begin? There is a locus point, like a point of focus where you're a witness of what's going on around you. There is a locus point that is me, quote unquote me, you're aware of, you're aware of a you, right? And it is an awareness. 
So you're conscious. You're consciously aware there is a you that exists. You are feeling and experiencing a physical body, right? So you can see me because your eyes are working. Your brain is responding to what it's saying. You're hearing me. Your body has temperature regulation. It's doing all the things, right? We've talked about that. One way to describe it is you're a witness. You're just observing. How much of this reality are you actually controlling? And if you think you're controlling this reality, that means you understand how this reality comes together, right? Consider what that would take. It's kind of a grandiosity, right? Maybe some narcissism, some fight mode to think you actually know how life should be, how the space should be. The truth is you're just witnessing it. You're experiencing it because your body is allowing you to, right? The body provides a physical perspective that allows you to witness a human reality. It allows you to experience the world around you. I'm gonna move this over here. That view kind of sucked. I think that's better. So you're witnessing. This is the key here in separating you from your body. Many people attach to the body as their survival, right? So I'm going to use myself as an example. I was an athlete. I did track and field here at Boise State. I was on scholarship to play volleyball. It provided me financial stability, praise, team, community, praise, right? It became my identity, right? So I took it personal. If I had a day where I struggled, I did the heptathlon. So I threw shot, put, jab, went all the things. And if I didn't do well, it felt bad. I was embarrassed. I actually experienced levels of shame, right? Which triggers fight or flight. So my body became a source of pride and inflation, a way to compete, a source of security, right? And it gave me an identity. What do you think happened right when my body became something that didn't have the same value can you see how that would create conflict but it's all in my mind it's all in a belief set it's all in the fact that i attached my wealth to the body you are witnessing this reality from a physical perspective that the body provides for you you are doing nothing it's providing you sight hearing touch pain pleasure it provided me uh, the ability to learn how to do things, right? How to jump high, how to run fast, how to contact a ball that's going really fast and hit it straight down, you know, how to block. It just provides a lot. I, I had a baby. I had three babies. What the hell? I didn't do that. I just had sex. That's actually not doing a whole lot either, really, you know? You are doing nothing. Your body is doing everything. All you are is the witness of all of its sensations that it's providing you and the ability that it has to understand and maintain homeostasis with complex environments. So this is an important thing you guys remember. But this 35 year old is unique. No car accident, no train accident, no bus accident, no Vietnam. I was born this way. Kenny's spine and legs failed to grow in the womb. And when he was six months old, doctors made the decision to amputate. Just because he doesn't have legs, it doesn't make him different than you or me. He can do anything you can do. Kenny has to fight harder for what he needs or what he wants. Divorced from his first wife. In 2004, he got engaged to his fiancee, Nikki. People want to know if Kenny has his private parts. Here, I'll just show you. <laughs> We're going to follow Kenny for a year of his life. 12 months that tests his relationship. To be honest, I don't think our relationship can be threatened much worse than it already is. Yes. And his health. I think he knows that if he doesn't have the surgery, that he may die. But whatever 
her life thrown at him, Kenny always fights back. No, mommy doesn't need to brush those people brush themselves. This is the remarkable story of the man with half a body. So with half a body, does that mean he's half a person, half an identity, half a soul? If you lose your legs in a car accident, I mean, this is important. Someone who's identified by their body would not want to live. They think life would be worthless because they've created a sense of self with their abilities, with the phys they've, they've attached a sense of survival with the body and the conditions of the body. Clearly, he had half a body. Clearly, his body was limited when you compare it to ours, but he wasn't limited. He found a way to have ability with the disabilities, right? No, no. Let me move this. Even though Kenny has half a body, he has complete and total awareness, right? His body is doing everything for him. And he's adapted, obviously, with the help of the body figuring it out, how to walk on his hands, right? So I think it's important that one of the mental, uh, that you really consider where, how you relate to your body. And if you're attaching your identity or sense of self to the body, to the conditions of the body, who you are by your nose your eyes, if you have enough body fat or too little body fat, more muscles or less muscles, how tall are you? That those are just physicalities that actually, what did you have anything to do with? Did you have anything to do with that? No. Think of how many generations before you promoted the, that DNA. So to actually attach to those conditions is a very large distraction and is a sign that you are triggered into survival mode. Which hierarchy do you think is triggered into survival mode if you think your body is bad or not good enough or unworthy? Anybody have a guess? Anybody? I kind of gave it away with that last word. Third hierarchy of need, your belonging. You don't think that your body is worthy of love, connection, because of some something. Now, was his body worthy of love and connection and sexual sexuality? Because he does have his parts. I cut a bunch out and they work. Of course he is. Is So to really consider how, how you might be thinking, I'm not worthy of that, that is a belief. You've internalized some privileged belief and then that puts you in a position to think your body is bad and then you're attaching to that to your survival. It's very important if you want to reduce mental health issues that you no longer attach who you are, your identity and your worth to your body. Okay, how do you identif identify who you are? It is an aspect of survival, period. Because it's, again, how we compare ourselves to our environment it's how we fit in. There's nothing wrong with this. It's a big deal, actually. It's just a matter of knowing when your survival needs it and when it doesn't, right? So most people don't even have an awareness that this is the case, so they don't have choice in the matter, right? Once you become aware of the survival aspects of identity and you see them as such, then things start to change because there's a spectrum of what you can be, what you can change into, how you can adapt, right? And it's a choice. If I wanna go to Italy and be like the Italians, that's a choice. I don't have to internalize anything. I can fit in, blend in, not stick out. Does that make me insecure or does that make me aware? Right? So having an awareness of how your identity is an aspect of survival is important. It is how you interact with other people, how you present who you are, especially with people you don't know. It's deeply connected to a sense of being worthy and of belonging and love. 
This is your third hierarchy of need. It's very much connected to this. Most people in this room, in this country, this is their problem right here. Why do I have constant anxiety when I go out in public? Human to human interaction, not having a sense of self that is coming from reality. You might be comparing yourself to elitist ideas of supremacy, what makes a good person. You might be fearful of being judged and criticized because you don't have the right clothes on. Again, that's body image, which is a part of identity. The list goes on. As food and shelter are provided by supporting adults, children learn the importance of fitting in and pleasing their family. This is normal. Learning to fit in, so adapting to your parents' beliefs, adapting to your environment, even if it's toxic and abusive. I was raised with a father who had horrible PTSD. He wasn't a bad person, but he beat the living shit out of us in rage fits and then had remorse and then went to church to try to control his temper. And then we ended up being indoctrinated in a really strict way to an authoritarian style church that seemed really appropriate under the circumstance. He did the right thing. Those are all survival mechanisms, right? Learning to fit in. So I adapted, right? I fit in. I kept quiet when I saw my siblings getting beat up. I, I was scared. I hid. That's adapting, right? Um, going to that church, internalizing it as who I was, and it was super important when in reality I wasn't traumatized. So it didn't necessarily help me in the end, right? Wanting to be seen as special is an important part of assimilating and belonging. Do you guys remember when you were young being like, mommy, 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 look, 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 watch, 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 watch. Everybody's like, you're probably still doing it. We're all still doing it at some level. That's a part of wanting validation that you fit in, that whatever you're doing is worthy of praise Right? In the beginning, it be, it's authentic. But after a while, if you get criticized, it becomes something that your parents dictate for you. Right? Because they're trying to get you to assimilate in this reality. And if in your parents' mind, you have to be superior, whatever you do is not going to be good enough because they want you to survive. So it might seem cruel in hindsight, but honestly, if your parent wants you to be superior because that's how they feel they can survive, is that not a loving act? To want your kids to be superior to? It is super loving, even though it is somewhat toxic and abusive. Yeah, that's what that is. Your sense of self can be shaped by ideas that are important to your family. So again, if the type of car your dad or your mom drives is important to them, that's something you're going to say, I want to have a nice car, I want to fit in. They want to be a part of that religion. If all they do is watch politics and they're raging on politics and how shitty the world is today, you're probably going to take that on as if it's a safe way to think and that's what you need to do for your survival. It can become part of your identity, right? These are things that not only give you attention and praise, but also criticism and exclusion. That can form part of how you, you formulate who you are as not good enough, not smart enough, I was rejected and abandoned, I was um, excluded from my friend groups, my boyfriend dumped me for another girl, that can impact how you perceive your worth and how you identify who you are. You can compensate. I've had so many clients who, because they had a weight problem that they think was a weight problem, um, compensated by becoming really intelligent or smart. So that became how they identified themselves as extremely smart, but not realizing that they were compensating for feeling a lack of worth because of someone's opinion about their body fat, right? Or becoming super funny, right? How we compensate or how I became an athlete because I felt stupid. I had a learning disability. Everything's backwards in my brain, right? ADHD, because I had some trauma as a child, feeling unsafe in my home. So I had a diagnosis of ADHD at second grade. All of those things changed how I formulated my sense of self, right? So I compensated by becoming super athletic and making that my worth. 
Motivation is the experience of wanting something or wanting to avoid it. When we study how we get motivated to learn, develop, and succeed, we can identify two contrary forces, extrinsic and intrinsic ones. On the one hand, we want to belong, desire to be loved, and seek to get the attention we think we deserve. We are motivated extrinsically by rewards in order to progress socially. On the other hand, we strive to explore things that are satisfying in themselves, disregarding rewards. We are motivated intrinsically by a natural curiosity which we follow because it feels right. The opinions of others don't matter. To understand why we probably need a good mix of both, Let's imagine two four-year-old children. Both grow up in families that want only the best for their kids, but have completely opposing views on how to motivate them to succeed. Tom's parents believe that all their boy needs is love. To not undermine his intrinsic interests, they never praise him or use rewards. Eventually, they decide not to give him any feedback at all, fearing it could corrupt his free mind. Over the years, Tom develops an immense capacity to imagine, spending most of his time playing by himself. By being allowed to follow his passions, he learns what he likes and what he doesn't. But Tom doesn't learn what others expect and gets easily irritated when asked to do something in a particular way. Mira's parents believe that their precious little girl needs clear rules about what's good and what's not. They see it as their duty to help Mira learn by providing precise and actionable feedback on all aspects of her young life. Mira spends her days in preschool, music, and ballet lessons. Over the years, she gets exceptionally good at the things that please the adults around her. However, since there is neither time to play nor to relax, she doesn't discover her own interests. Being alone bores her. At 14, Tom is independent and begins writing science fiction. He realizes that he isn't quite like his friends and spends most of his time at the library. When he shares his writing, others can't quite relate. At the same age, Mira is at the top of her class and has plenty of friends and admirers. She knows what is expected of her and makes sure to meet those expectations. Sometimes the pressure becomes unbearable, although that's her secret. By the day he turns 21, Tom has a unique perspective of the world. He is intelligent, but doesn't like to work for money and hence is always broke. He hates the idea of conforming to conventional norms and is annoyed if someone interferes with his creative expression. At this point, Tom knows a lot about himself, but doesn't connect well with others. To him, people seem to follow rules without questioning them, just like sheep. Integrating into the society is difficult at this point, and he begins to search for utopia. Mira makes it into a top medical school where she realizes she'll never be top of the class again. Once that place seems out of reach, her motivation drops and she wonders if medicine actually interests her. Since quitting is no option, she takes up a second major and runs for student council president. Soon, Mira will know everything about what others expect, but nothing about what she likes for herself. All her life, she has just listened, driven by external feedback loops. At this point, she's almost lost the ability to question the norms of the society she grew up in. Listening to our heart can tell us who we are, but not how to be happy among others. Listening to others can motivate us to be a part of their world, but doesn't teach us if that world is ours. This is why it's probably good for the two to go together. Then we can learn what we want and get the feedback we need in order to stay motivated to explore new roads into a better society. A large body of research shows that balancing the two forces is not straightforward. One meta-analysis of 128 studies examined the effects of extrinsic rewards on intrinsic motivation. While most rewards significantly undermine our intrinsic interests, Positive feedback, which is an extrinsic motivator, inspires us to keep going. Put simply, honest words of encouragement get us going, while money or gifts undermine our inner drive. What about you? Do you listen to your heart or to the voices of society? And from your personal experience, which of the two eventually takes your decision? Okay, let's talk. Talk about it with your team or with people around you. If you're in your, um, it's five minutes. Where do you tend to be internally or intrinsically or extrinsically 
driven. You guys might want to get in, get with someone else. I'm setting a timer. You just missed so much good stuff. So go back through the slides. God, you guys need, can, can, can you just remind me? Because that was amazing. I'm really good at this. We talked about pot. We talked about ganja. We talked about the Kardashians. Joe, Joe we talked about you Joe Rogan followers. All the shit. God. So it isn't a problem unless you can't tell the difference, right? So fitting in isn't a problem unless you cannot tell the difference between your authentic true self and some glamorized concept that is given to you, whether it's a concept that God will love you more or that you will find a man or you will, you will make enough money to support two families. I don't, you know, whatever it is, if you don't know the difference, that's the problem. I've assimilated kind of. I mean, I got mascara on. That's just an assimilation. I'm wearing fit. I look fit, kind of, right? right? <laughs> I'm trying. I didn't do my hair. Didn't have time. But there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with fitting in. Unless it becomes who you are. Unless you abandon yourself. Have you, had you abandoned yourself like we just talked about and assumed that whatever your basic self is is not good enough, you're gonna attach to something outside of your true self. And that is where trauma really begins. And again, it can be, it doesn't have to require someone molest you or that you get robbed. You can have a loving family, but the moment you abandon your true self or assume you are worthless, that's traumatic. Especially when you're five or six. You lose touch with your true authentic self because you assume it is worthy of abandonment or rejection. And then you gain touch with memorized ideas. And you don't, don't probably even know that this is happening. Your sense of self becomes the concept given to you by your community. So one of the things you'll hear me say, it's not, it's not self-worth, it's community worth, it's religious worth, body image worth. It can be getting, getting uh, educated worth. It can be a lot of different things, right? So being aware that if it doesn't begin at the toddler you were, uh, the, the natural, natural human qualities that you have naturally, there might be some problems. You're disconnecting from who you are. Is that right? Are we on this next? I think so. That, that pain goes back to that original disconnection. And so my other teacher, uh, A.H. Elmer says, speaking about childhood, the fundamental thing that happened and the greatest calamity is not that there was no love or support, the greater calamity, which is caused by that first calamity, is that you lost the connection to your essence. That is much more important than whether your mother or father, the father loved you or not. And by extension, I'm going to make the perhaps astonishing statement that, that, that the fundamental problem was not that you were sexually abused, was not that you were beaten, was not that you were abandoned, not that your parents couldn't love you the way you needed to be loved. It's that as a result of all that, you lost the connection to yourself. That's the trauma. So there's the external event, then the impact. And although it's, it's impossible to have it happen this way, but had you been beaten and abused, but had that not resulted in a, in a disconnect from yourself, you would not have been traumatized. And so that what are we looking for then is that reconnection with ourselves. And um, the loss of connection itself is an adaptation. Why is that an adaptation? Because if it's so painful to be myself, I better disconnect. If it's so painful for me to be aware of my gut feelings and to be able to assert them and to manifest them and to declare them, I better disconnect from my gut feelings. And it's that connection from the gut feeling which happens right in the body, that's the trauma. And then we spend the rest of our lives trying to compensate. How do we compensate? 
part of addiction. Overcome the state by developing certain personality patterns that then will uh, somehow try to get us indirectly what we didn't get in the first place, which is the love that would have allowed us to connect to ourselves. So then we become our personalities, at least we, 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 become, we, we become, we think we are as a personality. So if you didn't get the attention that you needed as a child, just for yourself, then you might become consumed by attracting attention, then you'll be attracted all the time. And hence the $30 billion cosmetic surgery industry, because people have lost the connection to themselves, and now they want validation from the outside. Or you didn't get the approval you needed for who you were, now you want to win approval from others as a substitute. You weren't valued for who you were, now you're consumed by measuring up to others' expectations so that you can get your sense of value to what others think of you, to what other people think of you. You weren't esteemed for who you are, now you really want to impress people all the time. Because we couldn't be ourselves, because being ourselves would have meant too much pain too much um, suffering, too much vulnerability. Vulnerability, the Latin word, vulnerare, to wound. Our wound would be too raw. We cover up our vulnerability by these compensatory mechanisms and we close our hearts. And when we close our hearts, we no longer know how to love ourselves or others. And we no longer have pleasure or joy. And then you have the statement by Meister Eckhart from the 13th century spiritual master. He says, a human being has so many skins inside, covering the depths of the heart. We know so many things, but we don't know ourselves. Again, that loss of self. Why? 30 or 40 skins or hides, as thick and as hard as an ox's or a bear's, cover the soul. And he says, <clears throat> go into your ground and learn to know yourself there. Well, why do we roll up these skins, these hides? These are the compositions. These are how we try and protect ourselves from that woundedness. I don't know why he does that. Go to the next slide. Um, that disconnection from like who you were authentically born as a human being in your human essence that disconnection is traumatizing. And at, because you're rejecting yourself. So that third hierarchy of need will never be fulfilled because you are rejecting yourself. So then you go get on a rat wheel and try to chase a mirage that someday you will accept yourself. But if you've rejected your truth, what are you actually accepting? What are you really accepting? Is it real or is it a concept? Because if you originally rejected your truth is not good enough, how can you accept something else? And if you do accept something else, it comes with a lot of conditions. So you're really never out of survival mode when it comes to relationships. This can be depressing, especially when you believe there is no hope to get better. And it may be that you rejected your truth at a very young age, you don't even remember it. And everybody else in the world seems to know what they and who they are because it's clear and obvious and they're following a program, right? But maybe you're not doing well at that program. This can be depressing and create chronic anxiety. Right, because you're in chronic fight or flight, you might not even know why, right? You might not even know why. You have food, you have shelter, you have loving parents, you're educated, you have support. Why are you having anxiety? Well, maybe it's your sense of belonging. Maybe you rejected and abandoned yourself, which is very traumatic. You don't need someone to do it for you. You did it for yourself at your core, right? <clears throat> Unless your worth, where you feel good about yourself is connected to the truth of your born character, what no one can give to you, what no one can take away from you. You will always suffer from fight or flight symptoms and you won't know why. 
right? But if you can recognize, oh, I do, I do feel that at my core, I'm worthless. I'm not special. I'm not important. I don't stick out, right? Maybe you've been taught that you need to stick out. You need to be special. You need to, be, you need to have all these followers. Maybe that belief is the trigger. What if that belief is wrong, right? If you're, uh, again, if your worth is attached to the basic and simple, isn't attached to the simplest truth of your born character, you will suffer from symptoms of fight or flight and continue to think that achieving something out there will make it go away. Does not work that way. The only way to get that third hierarchy to be secure, truthfully, so that you cannot focus on it, is to recognize that your innate human, the fact that you're alive and the body's providing you life and you have the potential of a whole life in front of you, that you're worthy of living that life at your foundation, that's how you secure that third hierarchy of need. That is the essence of recovering from mental illness. All of the research shows it. Self-compassion, self-compassion, not compassion because I failed at a system, compassion for the true self, for the kid there that was just funny and kind and liked to play. Compassion for your truth is the way out of mental health issues. The issue for many people isn't that you suck, it's that you were taught that you had to be superior. That's where the abandonment began. You're not important enough. This, the lack of sense of importance stems from cultures that are narcissistic. So we're gonna go into that. What is being superior? You were told you have to be better. You have to be better. You're not good enough. You need more self-help books. We need to constantly improving ourselves. That actually has an undermining effect to everybody's mental health who believes it. But Robin, how are we supposed to make ourselves better? You internalize that at some point. I'm not making myself better. I'm already there, right? I'm good enough. I'm kind. I'm whatever. Everything else is me expressing a life I want to live, right? This doesn't make me important. I, don't, I could care less about importance, right? But that takes securing yourself from the baseline, abandoning all those constructs, right? So being superior, what if your survival identity is based on being the best, being superior to others? How many of you were raised in an environment that said you are superior, you are to meet superior standards? Every freaking one of you, if you're American, seriously, we are the best. How about being an authority figure? I know more than you. We know more than everybody. We know more, right? That authoritarian supremacy air. Chances are you've abandoned yourself a long time ago. So narcissism, this is an important distinction and there is so much research in this area. So what we thought narcissism was 10 years ago is expanding or understanding it more as a survival mechanism. This is something we all have. We all have it. It's a matter of how it gets triggered and why. And it has everything to do with wanting to feel special. Remember that kid that said, me, 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 mom, 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 look at me, look at me. That's narcissism. You want to feel worthy of belonging through being special. This is a very important thing that drives a lot. It's very high energy. There is a degree of competency that goes into that, right? I want to look good. I want to stick out. This, this drives wanting to get better grades. This drives wanting to be included, right? So there's a lot of positive things in your survival that are really important as children in that state of narcissism, wanting to be special, wanting to be put on a pedestal, wanting people to be proud of you. That's what that is. When it becomes toxic is when that specialness is attached to being superior to others. So it's not just me being uniquely special. Wee, look at me, I'm special. It's my specialness is based on being superior to all y'all. I'm gonna win, I'm better than you. I'm the best, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the greatest. That is when it becomes narcissistic. It becomes abusive, right? Because just because someone wants to be, you know, loved and seen as unique doesn't necessarily be, mean you're toxic. 
But when your love and, again, connection is believed to come from being superior to others, now you're going to bully someone down. Now you're constantly comparing yourself. Narcissistic comparison requires a constant comparison, right? Because your security, your belonging is based on being superior to others. So you walk into a party and start comparing yourself. Am I as good looking as her? Is she thinner than me? Am I the most superior athlete in the room? Who has more money? What truck is he driving? Who's got more guns? I, who's higher? I'm higher on pot than he's high. Oh, let's do more. You, you're, there's all this constant comparison, right? That's narcissistic. You are on a hierarchy, right? A, a scale of comparison. Who fits in where? And the people who are, believe in narcissistic concepts have to be on the higher end. It's a concept of right, wrong. This is right, this is wrong, right? That's the kind of comparison. It's called a state of duality. It is a survival mechanism. That's how it works. If there was something in between right and wrong, that wouldn't be safe. That's vulnerable, right? Like running from a bear. There is, it's like the right turn or the wrong turn, right? That's why it is so sharp with this narcissistic comparison. Need to put others below you or above you. So oftentimes, when you come into a situation, if you're the person that's like, this is so shitty, this is such a piece of shit situation, this is really fucked up. When you're that person, you're probably in a state of narcissistic supremacy because you clearly think you know what is right, right? Um, in this situation, it would be like someone who's never taught a class judging me teaching this class. You think you might know, but have you taught a class? Have you done research on teaching a class? When have you tried to teach a class, right? So putting yourself in a position, always wanting to be superior is narcissistic. That is a survival mechanism. You're trying to feel worthy of love and inclusion. It comes from a deep seated sense of worthiness, or excuse me, worthlessness, right? Remember it starts with abandoning your true self and then believing that being better than others is the key to survival. These are people that constantly have to tell you all of their requirements, what they have, what they drive, what they, you know, all the things they do, all the things, all the specialists, they're trying to get a sense of fitting in in supremacy. I am a superior human, right? And if others succeed, it's your failure. So oftentimes your brain will position you to try to find something wrong. I had a client who she compensated because she had felt worthless because she wasn't a thin person, right? So she believed in thin supremacy and because she was in a narcissistic state of reality. So thinness was superior. If she wasn't thin, she felt horrible. So in order to make herself feel better, she would buy expensive clothes and expensive purses and expensive shoes. She became very successful in her narcissistic tendencies in this culture, suffering with extreme mental illness. And she recognized, like, I walk into a room and all I'm doing is looking at everybody else's clothes because I already know I'm the fat girl in the room which is her narcissistic shame that she's projecting onto everybody like anybody really cares, right? This is narcissistic comparison, trying to identify as a superior human, you'll do it any way you can, because that's how you survive. And in that state, when you're telling everybody else they're wrong, you have no context for why their choices might be appropriate, why your parents lovingly indoctrinated you into some religion that ended up harming you, that's loving, right? There's no context. You have no reality because you can't be in reality. You have to always be in an inflated state of superiority. So you cannot, reality to you feels like piece of shit crap because it's inferior, right? So this is suffering. This is mental health problems. And it's all about identity. When a person struggles to maintain that narcissistic self-concept, this is where the shame comes in. People who tend to believe or attach a sense of identity to these superior concepts tend to carry a lot of shame because a lot of these concepts are unreachable, right? So if you've attached to a dress code that requires extreme wealth and you don't have the money, you're going to feel bad, right? So people who tend to have this narcissistic identity as worthiness, whether you were raised in it, whether you compensated because your parents struggled, you tend to carry and harbor a lot of shame or are very sensitive to shame. All nothing, 
all or nothing, right? And oftentimes, if you struggle and reality around you is challenging and you cannot meet those standards, it can create an extreme crisis. Fight or flight on fire. Extreme panic. Anxiety attacks. Because your sense of self, which is not real, it's based on survival, isn't working out. So your survival gets triggered. So you'll have panic. You'll want to hide. You'll want to not be anywhere around people. You don't want to expose it. Because concepts of self are based around survival and fitting in, failing to meet self expectations, right? And I put quotes around self because it's not really who you are. It's a concept of self expectation can feel as if you are worthless. So that again comes from, I'm not superior. I, it goes back down to worthlessness. This can feel like death or a threat to your survival. It literally feels physically like you're gonna die. Anybody experience that? It's not, it physically feels like you're in threat, something dangerous is there and it doesn't make sense, but it shows up because you're feeling insecure, you're feeling a loss of your superiority or your control, the need to control. You can't control things. In reality, it literally feels like you're gonna get eaten by a bear or get heaved off a cliff or you're gonna drown. So when it comes to getting out of this, and this could be like a whole semester right here. Surrendering your survival. The only way for you to really get rid of these concepts of self that are conflicting with your reality is to surrender it. So what that requires is that you let it go, right? This is not easy. This is the hardest thing I've ever done, but I did it. It's like suicide. Allowing the loss of your survival self feels as if you're vulnerable to murder physically feels that way. All fight or flight responses are activated. Coping mechanisms that you used to do, like obsessing over this, cleaning this, going for a run, um, smoking pot, uh, drinking, all those things. If you surrender those coping mechanisms, survival is going to show its face. This right here shows up right there. And it is real to your brain and body. So when you surrender it, it feels like terror. To lose an identity feels like you're gonna die. This is why it's a crisis. Survival mode is fully experienced and if you don't respond with your coping, if you don't run, hide, fight, flee, fawn, if you stop, that's like putting the white flag up. It goes against all of our nature, right? All of a sudden, the fear that was there <clears throat> that you used to run and hide from goes away and the truth can then reveal itself because you're left with that itty bitty little person you abandoned. The courage to accept and allow the terror without response frees you from being held hostage by coping mechanisms, the quote unquote addictions, and, uh, and opens your mind to recall your original true self. That's the only way it can come forward. The truth becomes liberating and the essence of your survival is no longer attached. It is only then that you can accept the true self and get back to that authentic self. You have to accept that self. You have to ask if it was worthy of abandonment originally. And you might have abandoned it again as a child. So getting back to that place and believing that it's worthy of inclusion, even if it's basic, is um, is how you reestablish survive, you know, get rid of that survival trigger to then transcend that third level of hierarchy in order for you to have competence with the true self, your ability to handle things, right? The courage it takes. So who are you really? This is our class participation. Actually, why don't I do this? We'll make this homework so then you can add more points. So I will, this, I will post today's, I will go change the assignment. I think this is, did I put an assignment in there? I did. Like the participation. Did I? It's this. You're right. Okay. So this is your participation. We're not going to have time to do it in class today. You are to look at your identity, and we're going to compartmentalize it, right? And please don't tell me you got none, because that is such denial. We have it all. There's. I broke it into three, simply. 
you have your superficial fitting in. <clears throat> so you need to list how you superficially fit in. Ageism, racism, like I'm white. That gives me fucking privilege, right? Your looks, you're hot, whatever. Your language, how do you camouflage? How do you fit in without anybody knowing you? Sometimes it can be your language, right? Going to a party and being the one that's got the pot, you fit in, like it's superficial, right? There's no reality in that. List what those are for you. Community identity, where your sense of self is based in community. I was an athlete. I am now working on a, a master's and PhD. I used to have a religious identity. Like those are things that help you assimilate it. You want to know what those are. And then the true self, you get to go in. Who is, who are you really? So for me, these are mine. I'm safe. I mean no harm. I, no one here is going to get hurt by me. I can adapt to hardship. Give me anything hard. I can, I can, I'm cool with it. I'm easy, right? I don't abandon hardship very easily. That's a natural thing for me. I'm easy to be around. I allow people to be themselves. You can be who you are. That's a gift. I've always been that way. I was that way when I was born, right? No one can make that, give that to me. No one can take it away. And this one has been very clear. I'm fun. I love to have fun. I've always wanted to have fun. That's real. That's it. This is me. This is actually me. How hard is that? How, that's not very special, is it? So your assignment is to think about how you use these as survival mechanisms, where's the truth, how you fit into your community, and how you superficially fit in, like, with a group. I think that's it. So you're going to describe your true self, your authentic character, your community self, how you fit in, and your superficial self to the outside world. <clears throat> I did it. <laughs> One minute over. <laughs> Okay, you guys, we'll see you Wednesday. Um...